Hello and welcome to season one of Romance with Heart and Heat, your podcast and YouTube show for contemporary rom-com audiobook serials. My name is Marie Matthew and I'm the author of the stories you're going to hear on this channel. The title of season one is The Bad Girl List and this is a fake dating, second chance rom-com set in California wine country. Find out how one life-changing vacation list puts the heart of Dominique Chen on the line when she meets sexy wine grower Trevor Moretti. The content of this channel is intended for audience members that are 18 years and older. There is some explicit content on this channel, there is light swearing, and there are some explicit spicy scenes. So I don't want any surprises as people move into the story, so you have been warned. Be sure to stick around at the end of each episode for author commentary. And if you have any questions or comments, you can drop them into the comments section in YouTube, or you can also send me an email at romancingmarie at gmail.com. I'll do my best to answer questions and comments in future episodes on the show. Please like and subscribe to my channel on your favorite platform, whatever that happens to be. And please help me spread the word and share the show with your friends. Now, as you're listening along, if you get to the point where the tension's too much and you just can't wait to find out what happens next, you can head over to mariematthew.com and you can purchase the complete season of The Bad Girl List over on my website. It's available in ebook format, audiobook format, and there's also autographed hardbacks and paperbacks. So you will get the entire season for free on YouTube and the podcast. But again, if you just can't wait, head over to mariematthew.com. Thanks so much for listening. And now it's time for some romance with heart and heat. I hope you enjoy. Chapter 19. Terrace. Trevor. Dom's agitation is like sandpaper against my skin. As I try to figure out what has her so upset, the memory from our drunken tryst at Zeke's rises to the surface. I got really mad and decided to be a rebel, she'd said. Like the number of bad and irresponsible things I've done in my life could be counted on one hand, but I decided to rebel against my boss and she fired me for it. The pieces slide together in my mind. Just a few days ago, Dad had gone to San Francisco to meet with a design firm and Dom had just been fired from a design firm. The rebellion she mentioned is sitting right in front of me. It's easy to see what she meant. Most of the labels look like rehashes of everything else you see on a grocery store wine shelf, an illustration of the winery or vineyard on a cream or white background. Dom's designs break all boundaries. They are colorful, unique, and modern. I really love these, Dad says, but I'd like to see some variations. Think we can chat through them over a glass of late harvest? I guess so. Dom's eyes flick to her beaming family. In all our time talking, she never once mentioned that she worked on my family's label redesign. I wish she had said something to me, but I can understand why she didn't. And from the pride in the faces of her family, it's obvious why she hadn't worked up the nerve to tell them she was no longer with Presidio. I got her into this mess. That means I have to do something to get her out of it. Dad, it's the weekend and Dom is on vacation, I say. It's not fair to ask her to work. Helen says, I'm sure she doesn't mind. Dee says, Dom, you don't mind, do you? Mom says, Dom has always been the artist of the family. Dom says, I'm not really prepared. I don't have my computer or any of my notes or the design brief. No work, I say firmly. It's Sunday dinner, and I promise Dom a tour of our Viognier block. I take her by the elbow and rotate her body so that she faces the door. Tension oozes off her. We are faced with a wall made by her mom and two aunts. Excuse us, I say firmly. Dom and I are going to walk off our dinner. They fold apart like an accordion divider, making room for us to pass through them. Louise openly watches us, but the aunties only have eyes for the design boards. The three of them close back up behind us, continuing to exclaim over the artwork as I guide Dom past the table and out onto the veranda. She doesn't say a word until we are off the porch, over the gravel walkway, and into the vineyard. Her tension seems to ratchet up with every step we take. Finally she speaks. Trevor, I have to tell you something. Her sandaled feet send up puffs of loose dirt from the vineyard. I already know. What? You lost your job over my family's label redesign. She stops. How did you figure it out? I turn to face her. The moon is almost full, washing her smooth skin in pearly light. The look on your face. Your reaction back there. The little you said about your job. I rest my hands on her shoulders. You could have told me. She visibly wilts. I had no idea who you were when I met you. By the time I figured it out, it was just embarrassing. I almost had a heart attack when your dad first saw me at your house. I didn't think he recognized me. Dad never forgets a face. She grimaces. I won't make that mistake twice. Her chin tilts up, eyes searching my face. Thanks for bailing me out in there. What are you going to tell your dad about me? I'm not going to tell him anything. 
I'm not the idiot who fired you. I'll let your ex-boss explain to my dad why you aren't available to work with him directly on the project. I'm not sure what's going to hit my mom harder, Dom says. The fact that I broke up with Oliver, or the fact that I no longer work at Presidio. I wish I could say something to make her feel better. I wish I could gather her in a hug and squeeze all that tension out of her body. Do you want to go back inside and keep an eye on things? I ask. She hesitates, looking back through the wall of floor-to-ceiling windows, then shakes her head. You know what? I'm over this whole thing. At first I think she means she's over me, my family, and this whole fiasco I've orchestrated. I think she means she's done with me. But she isn't finished. If they find out, I'll deal with the consequences, she says. I'm tired of being stressed out. Annika is right. I need to stop worrying about what everyone will think, and just live my life. I need some fresh air. Will you take me on that walk? Of course. As I lead her into the grapevines, the bright green leaves flopping around us, she marches along beside me like a soldier on a mission. Have you ever considered that maybe you're not giving your family enough credit? I ask. What do you mean? Your mom and your aunts are nice. I mean really nice. That stupid award that Thomas brought out? And my swim team picture from high school. My family were raving lunatics, and your family acted like it was the most natural thing in the world. It embarrassed the hell out of me, but I think my mom could have brought out a dead cat, and your family would have been nice about it. It made my mom feel good. Don't take this the wrong way Trevor but you're not Chinese. You don't know what it's like. My grandparents on both sides worked their asses off to put all their kids through college. My dad's parents owned a dry cleaning business. My mom's parents owned a restaurant and Asian grocery store. My mom has a master's degree in engineering from Cal Poly, and my dad has a PhD in Cold War history. All my other uncles and aunties have degrees and good jobs. We're hardwired to be overachievers. It's in our genetic coding. They're going to be crushed when they find out about me. I consider her words. I can understand some of what she's saying. L had that drive Dom is describing. Anything less than an A was never enough. Anything less than 110% was unacceptable. You're right, I say. I'm not Chinese and it's not possible for me to understand completely. But just think about what I said. I think your family might surprise you. You wouldn't say that if you saw how much they adored Oliver, she says in a small voice. Or saw how proud they were when I was hired by Presidio. In her softness, I hear just how much she's struggling right now. I hate that she's feeling this way. Now that we're out of sight of our families, I do what I wanted to do earlier. My arm slides around her bare shoulders. I pull her against my side and squeeze. She leans her head on the side of my arm, her arms coming around my middle to hug me. My body responds to her nearness, my blood heating with a slow burn. I shift her body, rotating her into my front. She doesn't resist. Her head rests against my chest, her arms still looped around my waist. I run my hands up and down her yellow sundress. She feels so fucking good against me. My dick is already responding to her nearness. I shift just enough so she can't feel it. You know what I think, I say. What? I think Oliver is an asshat who will someday regret his decision to let you go. And I think by the time my dad is done browbeating your ex-boss, she's going to regret underestimating you. There are better things and better people out there for you, dumb. I know it. She leans back to look up at me, her eyes searching my face. You wanna know something, she asks. What? I wish you were available, and I wish you lived in the same zip code. As soon as she says it, she untangles her arms and breaks away from me. I stare stupidly after her as she walks away through the grapevines. It hits me that she hasn't missed the fact that I'm still wrapped up in L. I want to tell Dom I'm available. I want to tell her zip codes are only numbers on envelopes. I want to tell her that I want her in a way I can't explain. I don't say any of those things. Instead I hurry to catch up to her and say, there's a place I want to show you. It's right up here. Dom shoots a quick smile in my direction, and I'm again struck at how easy it is to be around her. Whether we're blabbing like teenagers or completely silent, it feels good to be near her. It had been like that with L2. We reach the end of the row. The vines part, revealing a set of steps that leads down to a terrace carved into the face of a tall cliff. Two rows of benches hug the wall. Near the overlook is a wooden archway planted with climbing white roses. The almost full moon washes everything in silvery light. Dom gasps. This is so beautiful. She hurries eagerly down the steps. I smile at her enthusiasm. We had this made for weddings. It's perfect. She stands beneath the archway, staring out over the dry creek valley. More vineyards stretch out in front of us. A soft breeze stirs the grapevines, causing the leaves to catch the moonlight as they sway. Is this where you and Elle were going to get married? She turns to look up at me as I come to stand beside her. I wish. I smile at the memory of Elle flatly refusing the idea when I proposed it. Normally I clamp down whenever someone mentions Elle, but I keep talking. I would have liked a small wedding, but Elle said we had way too many friends and family members to get married on a terrace the size of a tiny house. I didn't mind. I loved her so much, I would have gone through a drive through Elvis Chapel if she'd wanted. I gaze out over the vineyards. 
Sometimes, the life I had with L feels like it belonged to someone else in another dimension. I surprise myself again by continuing to talk. L was magnetic. She made friends instantly. I remember one day she told me she was going to have lunch with someone she met in the bread aisle at Safeway. I chuckle at the memory. I thought it was so weird but that was L. She liked people. My parents wanted her to help me with wine sales after we got married. She sounds like a dynamic person like your dad, Dom says. She probably would have been good at sales. Yeah. Pain spasms in my chest. Dom sees it. You okay? I'm okay. I take a seat on one of the benches, trying to sort out my thoughts. I want Dom to know why I live by myself and spend all my time with my three-legged rescue dog. I want her to understand why my parents went crazy when I brought her here tonight. And I want her to understand just how broken I am. I'm sorry, Trevor. Dom sits down next to me. I shouldn't have brought her up. It's fine, really. I want to be able to talk about her. She died on a sales trip. That's what I was thinking about. Dom takes my hand and squeezes it, giving me another soft smile. I'm sorry you lost her, Trevor. She sounds like an amazing person. It was hurricane season in Florida. I was with her and my uncle Theo. It was the first time I'd gone on a sales trip without dad. He's a bit of a control freak, in case you didn't pick up on that. Words gush out of me. I grip Dominique's hand like it's an anchor in a storm. It had been about a year since Elle and I graduated college. Dad sent us with Uncle Theo to a meeting with a wine buyer for a big chain store in Florida. We aced the meeting. I stare up at the moon, remembering the way Elle had laughed when I twirled her around in the parking lot. Uncle Theo gave a vineyard presentation. He ran all the vineyard operations before he died. Elle and I had done a ton of research on this particular chain of stores, and we knew the buyer's taste. By the end of the meeting, we had landed floor displays in every store in the entire state. It gave us the biggest rush. We couldn't wait to tell Dad. It's like a dam has opened up inside of me. Tears push at the back of my eyes but I can't stop. We knew a hurricane was coming, but we had spent months setting up this meeting. None of us wanted to cancel. We got caught in a rainstorm on the way home. Uncle Theo was driving. He lost control of the car and wrapped it around a palm tree. My chest heaves as emotion fights to be freed. They both died that night. L and Uncle Theo. That was the last time I ever went on a sales trip for the family. I came back and took over the vineyard operations. I know it sounds awful and selfish but sometimes I wish I'd died in that car with them. I don't even realize I'm crying until a tear hits the back of my hand. I think about Elle's dress with the blue butterflies and how hot her blood had felt against my skin as she died. I think about the drenching storm and sizzling lightning and the sound the car made when it hit the palm tree. Dom says nothing, her dark eyes large with compassion. In a smooth motion she gets to her feet and stands in front of me, pulling me close. Tears break forth, rushing to my eyes. I let Dom hold me, my face pressed into the swell of her breasts. This is the most I've ever said to anyone about the night of the accident. I haven't cried this much since Elle's funeral. I rest my hands on her hips, a cold shiver running through me as old grief flows out of me. Her lips feather across my forehead in the softest kiss. She doesn't tell me everything will be okay. She doesn't tell me Elle would want me to find meaning without her. She doesn't say anything. She just holds me, her hands running softly up and down my back, giving my grief space to do what it needs to do. I look up and take her face between my hands, running my thumbs along her cheekbones. She smooths my hair back from my face. When I pull her down for a kiss, she doesn't resist. It's a soft kiss at first, tender and gentle. Then I slide a hand around the back of her neck, pulling her closer and deepening the kiss. I swipe my tongue across her lips, tasting her. Her tongue meets mine. I grab her hips and pull her down to sit on my lap. A soft moan escapes her mouth as her leg nestles over my erection. The sound she makes short circuits my brain. For the second time in the span of a few minutes, Dominique breaks a dam inside me. Electricity arcs through me as I bring a hand down to cup her breast through her dress. It's not enough. I can't stand the flimsy layer of fabric between us. I need to feel her, need to have her skin against mine. I yank down the front of the sundress, exposing her to the moonlight. Her breasts are so fucking perfect. I lower my head and take one in my mouth, sucking greedily. I squeeze the other one with my hand, rolling her nipple between my fingers. Our movements become frantic. She claws at my shirt, dragging it free from my jeans as she sucks on my neck. I push her dress all the way down past her belly button and slide my hands over her perfect skin. Her hands climb up the inside of my shirt and sizzle across my torso. The desire I felt at Zeke's that first night returns. My dick is throbbing and I can't see anything beyond Dom's face. My only coherent thought is that I want her right here right now and I don't give a flying fuck if our extended relations are all sipping late harvest a hundred yards behind us. She tackles my fly, her fingers fumbling at the button. I growl in response and wad up the lower half of her dress, exposing a dainty cotton thong. It looks so perfect on her petite figure, but it's the only thing standing between me and what I want. I twist it between my fingers and tear. The panties fall away, revealing a dark triangle of hair. Blood pounds in my ears as Dom's hand dives into my pants and pulls out my dick. I groan as she tightens her grip around me, hand pumping up and down. 
Fuck that feels good. I grab her hips and pull her closer. My breaths rasp in and out of my nose as she continues to stroke me. I pull her legs around and tilt her back just far enough so I have a perfect view of her glistening folds. Fuck she's gorgeous. I run my hands through her wet pink folds, watching her eyelashes flutter as I work her clit. The way she whispers my name makes my body hum. I want to go down on her, but I'm held hostage by her hand around my cock. I try to remember if I have a condom, but I don't even know if I grabbed my wallet on the way out the door. I don't even know if I have condoms that haven't expired. I can't remember the last time I bought new ones. Fuck condoms. At the rate Dom is going, I'm going to come right in her hand. I work her clit harder, wanting her to come with me. Then her phone dings. Then, a few seconds later, it dings another three times. The effect is like someone throwing a cold bucket of water at us. Our eyes lock. I watch reality flood into her gaze as my own senses return to me. I can't tell what she's thinking. That might be my family. She releases my cock and does a haphazard job of trying to tug my boxers over it. She pulls her dress back up over her breasts before retrieving her cell phone. That sensation of an alternate reality returns. I feel like there are two Trevors out there. In one of them, this one, there is me, the man who fell in love with Elle. In another parallel universe, there must be another version of me who falls for Dominique Chen. The connection between us is a living thing. If I wanted to, I could reach out and touch it. It feels like an avalanche poised on a precipice. One shove, and the whole thing could come apart and sweep us away. What I feel for Dom crowds up close against the memories of Elle. It leaves me feeling disoriented and confused. It's Annika, Dom says. She says your mom and her friends are whispering about how cute we look together. What? I'm still struggling to come back to myself. Dom might be standing two feet away, but I can still feel the impressions of her hand around my dick and her nipple in my mouth. And apparently my mom keeps looking toward the vineyard. We would better get back up there. My sanity starts to return. It feels like anchors dropping out of the bottom of my feet. Sure. Okay. Her smile is hesitant. You okay, Trevor? Yeah. I stand from the bench. As I do, I notice her shredded underwear lying on the ground. Had I really done that? Um, do you mind? Dom picks up the slip of fabric and holds it out to me. I don't have a pocket, and I can't exactly put them back on. Sorry about that. The words come automatically, but then I wonder if I really am sorry. It's fine. Even in the darkness, I see her face flush. Another rush of heat goes through me as I crumple the cotton in my hand and shove it into my pocket. It takes all my willpower not to grab her and kiss her again. We should probably get back before they send out a search party. My tongue feels thick in my mouth when I speak. Okay. She smiles at me as we walk back up to the event center, both of us careful to keep space between us. Chapter 20 Memory Trevor The dinner party wraps up shortly after we return. Dom and I stay a healthy distance away from each other, keeping our goodbyes casual as her family loads into their minivan. My parents are relaxed and good-natured, not doing anything else weird thank God. Gramps and his friends are riled up after losing money to Dom's family, and there's talk of a rematch, but I don't pay much attention. I'm too busy pretending not to be watching Dom's every move. I'm too busy thinking about how much I want to call her when dinner is over to see if she wants to come back to my place. I'm too busy being preoccupied with how badly I want to be number 10 on her bad girl list. It isn't until I'm driving back to my house the memory of Dom's mouth and body clogging up my brain that something happens. It starts as a feeling of uneasiness. An old memory surfaces, one so old I'm surprised it's still rattling around in the recesses of my brain. It's from a time in kindergarten when I'd been caught stealing a bag of potato chips from someone's lunch bag. When I'd been caught, I remember the look in the girl's eyes when the teacher made me apologize and return the chips. I'd felt so small and ashamed. It's an uncomfortable juxtaposition to think about the feel of Dom's nipple in my mouth next to that moment with my five-year-old self. I try to focus on Dom, but the uneasiness continues to grow. An image of Elle fills my mind. I see her bright eyes and wide smile. She's so dazzling that my heart lurches. My breath catches, but not in a good way. I slam to a stop under my carport and throw the truck into park right before the trembling starts in my hands. I know what's happening to me. I'd gone through a period of panic attacks for a few months after Elle died. I thought I had left this behind me, but as I struggle to get my breathing under control, I feel her loss as strongly as I felt it in the beginning. It's jagged and raw and feels like someone is tearing my heart out of my chest. I rest my forehead on the cracked leather of the steering wheel and grip it with both hands as the tremors take me. I force myself to breathe deeply through my nose as I count backwards from 10. By the time I get to 2, the shaking has subsided. By the time I get to 1 I feel exhausted and drained, but at least I can breathe again. I get out of the truck and walk slowly toward the back slider door. My stomach is heavy, that feeling of shame weighing on me. My phone dings with a text message. I pull it out of my pocket before I can think better of it. It's a message from Dom. I had fun tonight, she says. I stare at the message. She's the first person I've met since losing Elle that makes me feel alive again. 
I should write her back. I want to write her back. I want to ask her if I can pick her up at her VRBO and bring her back to my place so we can finish what we've started twice already. I want to ask her if I can be her number 10. But I can't shake the sick feeling in my stomach. It feels like I'm cheating on L. Logically, I know it's impossible for me to cheat on L. She's gone. But I still see her vibrant smile in my mind's eye. I can't even chalk the events of tonight up to alcohol like I had at Zeke's. I was completely sober, and if Annika hadn't texted, I probably would have fucked Dom right there in the vineyard. God knows I wanted to. Tequila barks in greeting when I enter the house. She wags her tail and hops around me in a happy circle when I let her out of her crate. Not even the sight of my beloved dog is enough to lift my spirits. My body feels heavy like I haven't slept in days. Slumping onto the side of my bed, I pull out my cell phone and stare at Dom's text message. My fingers hoover over the buttons, trying to figure out what to say to her. Then I abruptly turn off my phone. I drop it into the top drawer of the nightstand, leaving Dom's message unanswered. Who says you need a plus one for a satisfying date night? Meet Hello Date Night, the book box that contains everything you need for a perfect night of pleasure. Each box comes with an autographed copy of The Bad Girl List, a discreet feminine pleasure toy with a matching travel bag, and a sensual rose candle. Say yes to your perfect date night and head over to mariematthew.com to purchase this limited edition book box today. Chapter 21. Ghosted. Dominique. Did he text back yet? Annika asks, pulling her pajama top over her head. I'll cover for you if you want to sneak out with him. I shake my head. He didn't write back yet. My skin still hums from its contact with Trevor. The feel of his body and his touch have left me wanting more. More than anything, I want him to be my number 10. I told you he liked you, Annika says triumphantly. I told her everything as soon as we got into the safety of our bedroom. You should have shagged him in the vineyards. That would have been hot. Yes, it would have been hot. You sent those text messages and I got paranoid. Annika makes an annoyed sound in the back of her throat. If I'd known what you guys were up to, I wouldn't have bothered you. I glance at my phone again but still no message from Trevor. I shouldn't feel disappointed. It hasn't been that long since I sent the message. He could be helping his family clean up the event center. I decide to distract myself. I leave the phone on the nightstand and go through the motions of getting ready for bed. A part of me hopes he'll text back and want to go out, but I'm not desperate enough to sit around in my clothes waiting. 20 minutes later, still no response. The giddiness I felt has changed color, morphing into something uneasy. I swipe the screen and open the text. Next to my message is a red notation telling me he received the message. Why hasn't he written back? It's fine, I tell myself. He's probably just tired from tonight. Based on the text message he sent me that morning of his dog, I know he's been up since before sunrise. Anything? Annika comes back into the room and closes the door, her hair wrapped in a bun on top of her head in preparation for sleep. No. I stare at the phone, not wanting to be the desperate girl who leaves her phone on all night, hoping to hear from her crush. Except I am that desperate. I want Trevor so badly I can hardly see straight. If he asked, I'd be out the bedroom window and waiting on the curb for him to pick me up. Swallowing, I force myself to turn off my ringer and put my phone on airplane mode. I refuse to stay up half the night checking my phone for a message every few minutes. I'm sure you'll hear back from him before morning, Annika says. But when morning comes, there's still no message. The realization that I'm not going to hear from him again leaves me feeling sick with disappointment. I am such an idiot. There could be any number of reasons why he hasn't written back yet, but I know exactly why I'm being ghosted. Trevor Moretti is still in love with his dead fiancé. The story of how he'd lost Elle, then the way he'd rested his head against me and cried. I'd been swept up in the moment, flattered that he'd shown me his vulnerability and his pain, and betrayed by my own attraction to him. But now that the lust has worn off, I'm left to stare the hard reality in the face. Trevor Moretti is out of my reach. Yes, he likes me and yes, I think he'd sleep with me but he's still in love with Elle. He didn't text me back because he's still hung up on her. I feel let down and embarrassed. Compounding that is the fact that I went to his family dinner last night. What about his promise to help me with the bad girl list? Now that I helped him get his family off his back, is he done with me? Oh shit. Annika stares at me as I stare at the unanswered text on my phone. Is that fuckhead ghosting you? I nod and quickly set my phone down. The fact that she's confirming what I already know makes me feel even worse. Annika purses her lips and swings her feet onto the floor. You know what you need? A bottle of common sense? No, you need a tattoo. I'm making you an appointment. Annika types into her phone. I don't know what I want yet, I protest. Tough shit cuz. You have between now and 8 o'clock tonight to figure it out. There. She taps her phone harder than necessary before setting it down. You're officially on the schedule. But. You're an artist Dom. Draw something for your body. It's not that hard. 
I swallowed the barrage of excuses. If I'd spend a little more time thinking about a tattoo, and less time with my head up my ass over an unattainable guy, I wouldn't be in this situation right now. Come on. Annika flings the covers off me. You are not allowed to let that shithead ruin your vacation. Out of bed. Now. We have a Groupon for Manny Petties, then two-for-one coupons for box lunches at a deli by the coast. I rally. Annika is right. This is my vacation. I've only known Trevor for a few days. So what if he's ghosting me? He's not a bad guy, he's just in love with Elle. It was stupid for me to get my hopes up, and it was stupid for me to get physical with him last night. I need to focus on what's important, namely, coming up with a design for my tattoo. Fifteen minutes later, Annika and I enter the kitchen to find a debate brewing among the aunties. My mom says, we're going to have to rearrange some things to make this work. Andy Helen says, I had to sign up for six different mailing lists to get tonight's dinner coupon. Auntie D says, just flag their emails as spam. That will get rid of them. Andy Helen says, six mailing lists. Do you know how much time that took? Mom says, I think I know a way to use tonight's coupon and fit in the casino. What are you guys arguing about? Annika plops into a chair and grabs a glass of orange juice. Tony Moretti and his friends challenged us to a blackjack tournament, Mom explains. Annie Helen says, they want to win back the money we took from them last night. When Trevor and I returned from the vineyard last night, the old-timers and the aunties had been at the tail end of an intense card game. When the aunties won, they jumped up and down and cheered, while the old-timers each threw a $20 bill onto the table. Auntie D says, they challenged us to a rematch. They want us to go play blackjack at the local Indian casino. Mom says, whichever group has the most chips at the end of the night wins. Auntie Helen says, and the losers have to treat the winners to a buffet dinner the following night. Ah, I understand the problem. This challenge means rearranging two schedules. I learned a long time ago not to get involved in vacation scheduling, I say, walking over to the egg carton sitting on the kitchen counter. I'll scramble the eggs while you guys work things out. As I crack the first of the eggs, mom gets up from the table and comes toward me, leaving Auntie Helen and Auntie Dee to argue over logistics. Dom, she says, you haven't mentioned Oliver much in the last few days. Is everything okay? Yeah, mom, everything is fine. Have you guys talked since you left San Francisco? I consider coming clean, then rule it out. I'm still feeling sad about Trevor, and I'm not in the mood for drama with my mom. Dom? It's tax season, remember? Oliver doesn't like to be bothered during tax season. It's a perfectly believable statement. Mom has been hearing that story for the past five years. Okay, she says. If you want to talk about anything, I'm here. Thanks, mom. Everything is fine. I shift my attention to the eggs, hoping she'll get the hint and drop the subject. Okay, sweetie. Mom drifts back over to the kitchen table. She obviously picked up on the chemistry between me and Trevor, despite our best efforts. Or maybe she'd overheard someone in Trevor's family say something. It really doesn't matter. I'm on vacation, and I'm not going to see Trevor Moretti again. She'll forget him in a day or two. Now, I just have to figure out the best way to tell her about Oliver. Hello guys, welcome to the Marie Matthew Show. I am the author of The Bad Girl List, Marie Matthew, and this is the author commentary portion of the show. Before we get started, I have to show you guys something. If you're not on YouTube, it's okay, I'll describe it, but I'm wearing like the cutest owl shirt. Can you see him? <laughs> he's so cute, he's a wisdom owl. He's this kind of multicolored, vibrant owl on my shirt, you guys. I love owls, and I'm also wearing an owl barn owl ring, if you can see him. I'm recording this episode right after Christmas and I believe in buying my own Christmas presents. <laughs> I don't put any pressure on my husband. I buy my own presents. I tell him not to worry about it. So this ring <laughs> was one of the things I bought for myself for Christmas. I just had to show you all of my owl get up today because I love owls. They're really magical for me. Anyway, let's jump into the episode. And of course, we always like to start our episode off with a tasty beverage. And today I am bringing you Foresight Pinot Noir. It's a 2016 vintage. The grapes are from Anderson Valley, which is an area north of Sonoma County. So I would say it's about an hour north of where the story takes place. Hmm, maybe I'll do a story up in Anderson Valley one of these days because let me tell you, their wines are so, 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 so good. Oh my God. This particular Pinot Noir, we're gonna call him Papa Mike, that's my dad. This is from Papa Mike's cellar because Papa Mike only buys good wines and um, he loves Pinot Noir. So I get to drink a lot of Pinot Noir. This particular one, they only did 125 cases. It was aged in barrels and you can totally smell the vanilla when things are aged in barrels. A lot of times you can smell the wood and it comes off as like a vanilla scent and it has like a particular flavor in your mouth so you can even taste it. So this one, 
you get that oakiness and it's mixed with this like dried fruit flavor, dried berries. It's so good. It's so good. It's light enough you can drink it with anything or you can drink it on its own like I'm doing now. <laughs> so anyway, cheers. And as always, I will link Foresight Winery in the show notes if you want to check them out. Always love to uh, give props to our little local wineries. Today we find ourselves in episode seven of the Bad Girl List, which I entitled Ghosted. And obviously I entitled it that because in this episode, Trevor ghosts Dom. And you know, in a romance novel, they can't get together in the first three pages, right? <laughs> they have to overcome some struggles. They have to really like earn the true love. They have to earn the happily ever after. So this particular episode is about a hurdle that they're facing as a couple and as a potential couple, I should say, since they're not quite together yet. Trevor in particular, having to deal with his own demons. And I love this chapter because, you know, love isn't always easy. It's beautiful, but you do have to work for it. And I, I thought it would be, hmm, I don't know, fun, but I feel compelled to share a real life love story that I had the gratitude and the blessing of witnessing recently. It was with my in-laws, my father-in-law and my mother-in-law. They have been married for 62 years, like six two. <laughs> 62 years. A lot of people don't even live that long. They got married young. They've been together their whole life. They've been together. They've been a unit for 62 years. It's a beautiful thing. Recently, my father-in-law had to go into an assisted care facility and it was a really, it was a hard time. It was a hard time for the family emotionally and most especially for my mother-in-law. She really did everything she could to keep him at home as long as possible. So it was only when things, when the struggle became more than she could physically endure, she made the decision to put him in an assisted care facility. You know, my daughter and I, we, we'd go visit him on Sundays and my father-in-law loves wine. He totally loves wine. I know for a fact that my mother-in-law and other family members made sure that they took wine to this care facility to make sure that he could have wine at dinner. And we were talking to him and I said, oh, dad, you know, did you find anyone to have, you know, wine with at dinner? Are you in, in getting your wine every night at dinner? Because he loves to have a glass of red wine or Chardonnay. He just kind of looked at me and he said, you know, I don't, I don't have rosemary to enjoy my wine with so I don't have any wine and like there was a part of me that like that it, my heart broke a little bit because I didn't realize that the ritual of drinking wine how that was something they did together and it was also an expression of their love as a couple was to share wine together every night I didn't understand how entwined that was and on one hand it made me really sad because he didn't have it but on the other hand like I saw how beautiful that was like how beautiful he had that ritual that he shared with his wife for 62 years drinking wine together uh, it was definitely a passion of theirs their whole life um they always went wine tasting and had a huge wine cellar and loved wines and had wine parties so wine was just had a significant role in their life and it was interesting as my daughter and i were sitting there talking to him there was a lot of comings and goings like people ringing the doorbell people coming in and out workers moving around like all this activity and my father were like he wasn't paying attention to any of it. And then in the middle of all of this, like hub blue, the doorbell rings. And all of a sudden, like his entire body went alert. Like he's, he was sitting up straighter on the couch. He was like looking over his shoulder. He was trying to see who it was. And it was the first time he had acted like this. All the other times he wasn't paying any attention. And so I look over towards the doorway and I'm not even kidding. My mother-in-law was the one that walked in the door. <laughs> wow, like even just talking about it, it gets the chills. I was like, he knew it was her. Even though he didn't know it was her, his subconscious and his body, like he knew the love of his life was showing up to come see him at that very moment. And he was, he was on high alert. And then she walked in and sat on the couch and you know, they were holding hands and it was really cool. And I was just telling my, that story to my husband, like it, it was just, so beautiful. It's the sort of love you do have to work a lifetime for. I wish you could get it in a 300 page book, but <laughs> that kind of love, 62 years in the making. And let's face it, like really beautiful, right? Really, really, really beautiful. So I found it really inspirational and I thought it would be nice to share that story, especially because this episode was a little, a little hard and sad. And we do know that there are hard and sad aspects of love. I felt compelled to share a story in my own life of a love that is going through things that are hard right now, being separated, but yet 
like it's still there. The love still perseveres. I find it so beautiful and magical and, um, oh, getting a little <laughs> choked up. I felt really blessed to witness it. And I made sure the rest of the family heard about it. Like, you won't believe this, <laughs> how cool this was. Like this connection that they have, it's so deep. <laughs> he knew she was there before he knew she was there. Oh, I'm crying a little bit. <laughs> Anyway, so that was the story that I wanted to share with you today, and I hope you enjoyed hearing it, and I hope it brought a little joy to your heart, how beautiful love can truly be. That wraps up today's episode. I really hope you enjoyed hearing the story. I always very much appreciate having you here, listening to my stories, being a part of this romance world that I'm building. I really, really appreciate it. You can always reach out to me at romancingmarie at gmail.com. You can leave comments in YouTube. I always try to read those and respond. And of course, you can always find me at mariematthew.com. You can get autographed hardbacks and paperbacks of the Bad Girl list. You can get ebooks, audiobooks, and of course, we have our amazing, exciting Hello Date Night box, <laughs> which you can also purchase over on the website. So please come visit me there. I would very much appreciate it. And until next week, cheers, everyone. Have a good one. Bye.